Turn it on. That's an always a good start. Welcome. Um, we're um, really, thank you for joining us for um, this uh, distinguished visiting lecture um, for the month. We're really excited to, um, to be hosting John Pruitt. Dr. John Pruitt is um, coming, visiting us from uh, the University of Washington, um, where um, he has a, um, what did I say? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, Washington University in St. Louis. Um, Dr. Pruitt um, first went, I just found out, just went to, um, completed college undergraduate at Princeton, but since then has been at um, Washington University, um, where he completed his PhD, MD, PhD, and has been um, really um, building a really um, successful research and clinical research program is a world expert in infant brain imaging, studies um, autism, and using brain um, imaging to predict um, future, future onset of autism in babies, and that's what's the focus of what he's gonna be talking about today. Um, so please join me in welcoming, me, welcoming Dr. Pruitt. Thank you. So thank you very much, and it's an honor to be here. I'm gonna to speak today about MRI-based presymptomatic prediction of autism spectrum disorder. I have no conflicts of interest. I'll start with acknowledgements. This is the work of many people. The Infant Brain Imaging Study Network, of which uh, I am a part, uh, led by Joseph Piven at Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And I wanna point out that uh, Minnesota here is actually an IBIS site. Uh, Jed Ellison and Jason Wolf. In addition to the members of the IBIS network, my local collaborators are Steve Peterson, Brad Schlager, who left us for Kennedy Krieger, Avi Snyder, and Alex Todorov. And in this talk, I'm gonna feature the work of some junior investigators, Adam Egebrecht, Natasha Maris, Claire McKinnon, and Robert Emerson. And my lab staff is Tom Nishino, Savannah Davis, and Alicia Raka. So, I'm gonna speak about the problem of early identification in autism spectrum disorder. I'm then gonna talk about group level behavior findings, group level MRI findings, individual outcome prediction findings, and talk about our future directions. So autism spectrum disorder involves deficits in social communication and interaction and restricted and repetitive behaviors. It must manifest in the early developmental period, and there has to be impairment. And the uh, features of autism spectrum disorder are not better explained by intellectual disability or global de developmental delay. The prevalence of autism spectrum disorder is one in 59, and this seems to keep rising. It's one in five if there's an older affected sibling, and that's gonna be a focus of the talk here where we talk about high familial risk infants where there is an older affected sibling. We know that medication helps with irritability, but it has minimal effect on the core behavior features of autism. Behavior interventions have been shown to improve outcome, but these effects have been highly variable in studies. So we can make a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder at 24 months. However, in the United States of America, the median age of diagnosis is over age four, which is a problem because intervention typically does not occur until a diagnosis is rendered. So we've learned a lot over the last decade plus about how autism spectrum disorder unfolds in the first years of life. And we've learned this from a research design known as the baby sibling design or the prospective high-risk infant uh, sibling design. So here we have a high familial risk infant, so that means there's an older affected sibling. This new baby now may have a 20% chance of developing autism spectrum disorder. This makes it efficient to do prospective studies. And so these high risk babies can now be followed longitudinally. Diagnosis can be given at 24 months or 36 months. And we can look back and we can say what, what was different along the lines of behavior measures or imaging measures or any other kinds of assessments. And so this is a figure from a seminal research paper by Sally Ozanoff's group. And here they looked at the trajectory for behavior development along a number of lines. So the top is coded gaze to faces, 
This is coded directed vocalizations, and you're showing in red high-risk infants that went on to develop autism, and the dashed line is infants developing typically. And one very important thing about this is that at six months of age, on these important social measures, these groups of infants are indistinguishable. So the curves diverge over the second year of life. So we've learned that there's an early prodromal, or we've used the term pre-symptomatic period, followed by a period of time between 12 and 24 months where the characteristic and defining behavioral features of autism spectrum disorder unfold. And so our question then, thinking about that early period, is could we identify ASD before its key behaviors consolidate? And in doing so, could we triage to earlier interventions? And there's thinking that earlier intervention is better, and there's emerging evidence that says that may be true. So the question is, if we could intervene in the pre-symptomatic period, would we have an even greater improvement in outcome? And we think that brain MRI is one possibility. And with that, I mentioned this infant brain imaging study, which is a study involving uh, many universities across the United States and Canada. It was started in about 2007, uh, led by Joseph Piven at Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And the original four clinical acquisition sites were Washington University, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, North Carolina, University of Washington, and we have a data coordination center at the Montreal Neurologic Institute. I will point out now Minnesota is a site. Um, we've expanded. Um, but this first wave of infants, we had a large number of high-risk infants. As I mentioned, 20% will develop a uh, diagnosis of, of autism spectrum disorder. We also, importantly, have low-risk controls, so it's a neat familial design where we have high-risk infants, some developing autism, some developing more typically, and we have low-risk control infants. The original study involved structural MRI and diffusion tensor imaging at 6, 12, and 24 months with detailed behavior assessments and a research diagnosis of autism according to clinical best estimate at 24 months. I do functional brain imaging, in particular functional connectivity MRI, and I'll explain what that is. We added this at the Wash U site in 2009, and there was great interest in this, so we expanded it to all the sites in 2010. 2012, we got independent R01 funding for this, and the network overall also renewed. And with that renewal, we added more high and low risk infants with behavioral follow-up on the first cohort. And we are now in the third cycle where the infants uh, studied way back are now returning to us in school age. And as I mentioned, we have a new project that I'll talk more about at the end where we're enrolling new high-risk infants uh, in Minnesota as a site for that study. So I'm going to move on and talk about group-level behavioral findings. And so one of the first and important group-level behavioral differences that our network published on at 12 months of age involved repetitive behavior. And this was led by Jason Wolf, who is now a faculty member here. And so here what we're looking at is trajectories for different forms of repetitive behavior. So this was a total repetitive behavior score, a self-injury score, a stereotype behavior score, and we're showing high-risk infants who develop autism in solid line, high-risk developing uh, without a diagnosis of autism in this dashed line, and the dotted is the low-risk controls. And this uses a parent report measure called the Repetitive Behavior Scale Revised, which was validated for use in infants and toddlers. And we found statistically significant differences and elevations in repetitive behavior in the high-risk babies that went on to develop autism as early as 12 months. And in parallel to that, this study was led by Jason Wolf, who is a faculty member, or Jed Ellison, who is now a faculty member here as well. Um, and what Jed and colleagues did was here, instead of looking at parent report, they looked at video codings of a developmental assessment known as the CSBS, and they coded repetitive behavior from the babies uh, while they were uh, performing this developmental assessment. And so what we're showing here are elevations in repetitive behavior in red for the babies who go on to develop autism, 
Blue is the babies who are high risk, who don't develop a diagnosis of autism, and gray are the low risk controls. And this is showing repetitive behaviors involving the body, involving objects, and a total repetitive behavior score. And again, these differences are at 12 months. And that's important because when I did my clinical training in child psychiatry over 15 years ago, I was taught that babies who develop autism will show some social deficits, problems with eye contact. Maybe they're not speaking or putting two words together. You might be worried about that around 18 months, and then you watch and see, and then maybe by 24 months, you might see uh, hand flapping or circling or head banging. Uh, but what this shows is that in the babies who do go on to develop autism, these repetitive behaviors are present and start to emerge as early as 12 months. So that was an important finding. Our network also published the first demonstration of early behavioral differences in the first year of life. So this was led by Annette Estes at our University of Washington site. And here we looked at um, divergence on a, a measure known as the Mullen scales of early learning. That's kind of like a baby IQ test. It has motor scales, language scales, other cognitive scales. And this is adaptive behavior measured by the Vineland adaptive behavior scales. And so again, this is showing age at six months, 12 months, 24 months. And in red, we have babies who are high risk developing autism with high autism symptoms, lower autism symptoms, Green are the high-risk negative infants, and blue are the low-risk controls. And there was a statistically significant separation as early as six months, and in post hoc testing, this played out along uh, the lines of findings on gross motor scales and visual reception scales. So again, not autism-specific symptoms, but an early group-level behavioral difference. And you can see how these then fan out as the babies go on and develop. So, importantly, early behavior is not sufficient to predict outcome at the individual level. Um, and we don't believe that there is any current published evidence of highly accurate autism outcome prediction based on behavior information in the first year of life. With our data, so in parallel to the findings I'm going to show you with brain MRI, we tried to do this with information from the massive behavioral battery that we have in this IBIS study, and we could not achieve statistical significance for outcome classification. And so what that means is that infant intervention for high-risk siblings is therefore going to be in highly inefficient because you're going to have to enroll all high-risk infants. You don't know which infants are going to develop autism and the infants who aren't. And it's very difficult to think about how to do this then in the general population where prevalence is 1 in 59. So the question is, can information from the brain help? And we know from other disorders such as Parkinson's that brain changes often precede behavior changes. And maybe this is true in autism. And in the late 90s and early 2000s, there were a series of publications about differences in head size in autism. So it was found that children with autism tended to have larger heads. It's not that we could diagnose autism in the clinic with a tape measure, but this was then extended to show that it was uh, brain volume differences that were related to these differences in head size. And I'm showing a figure here from a paper in 2005 by Heather Hazlett, who's the University of North Carolina site PI for our IBIS study. And she's showing diverging head circumference trajectories for infants in red who go on to develop autism versus combined control infants. And you can see that there's really no difference in the first year of life, and these curves start to diverge around 12 months. The important thing about that is that this finding about altered trajectory for brain growth suggests that maybe the behavior features of autism are related to altered brain wiring in circuits that are important for the characteristic behaviors of autism. And so our infant brain imaging study gives us the opportunity to study these phenomenon in a large sample during the time that we think all this is playing out. So infant MRI poses some very significant challenges. 
and this is a figure from a paper by uh, Rebecca Nickmeyer, and this is showing uh, T1 and T2 weighted imaging at birth, at one year, and at two years. And you can see massive differences in size and shape and in MRI contrast. And this is challenging, but we can overcome it. So here I'm showing individual data. This is now six months, 12 months, 24 months, T1 weighted imaging. And what you can see is that the gray-white separation is very indistinct here, whereas here at 24, there's a much more mature pattern of myelination, and you see better gray-white separation. <coughs> I'm showing the same for T2-weighted imaging, and you can also see, if you look closely, that some of the contrast reverses, so what's dark early is light later, et cetera. And again, we see a much more adult-like pattern of brain myelination, the white matter here that's dark color um, on this T2-weighted image at 24 months. But we've overcome a lot of the challenges associated with dealing with these data, and I'm gonna go on to talk about group-level MRI findings that our network has published. So one of the first findings, and this was a study led um, also by Jason Wolf, and here we looked at the development of white matter properties using diffusion tensor imaging and looked at a measure called fractional anisotropy. So in diffusion imaging, we're looking at the diffusion of water molecules. So the water molecules in here are free to diffuse around any direction. If I took a cup of water and I put a pack of spaghetti in that cup of water, the water molecules would then be more constrained to diffuse along the strands of spaghetti. And we talk about that constraint as being fractional anisotropy, so the movement is anisotropic. And in imaging, this measure, fractional anisotropy, or FA, is thought to reflect white matter development. Higher levels mean more maturity. So we looked at this in multiple important fiber tracks, in a large number of infants, 28 of these infants developed autism, and showing here the individual trajectories with overlaid means, red for the babies who went on to develop autism, blue for the high-risk babies who did not, an interesting pattern emerged where contrary to what you might expect, the babies who went on to develop autism at six months actually had higher levels of fractional anisotropy it looked what we would say in studies of older subjects to be more mature. Then the curves crossed, and then they look like they have lower FA at 24 months. So another important thing is that we studied this longitudinally and developmentally, and if we had only looked at one of these time points, we would have had a very different story. So. These things are playing out very dynamically across the period of time we're looking at, and considering the change across this period is very important to getting the story right. And this finding was present in 12 of 15 of the major fiber tracks that we looked at. Another structural MRI finding involved differences in the shape and size of the corpus callosum, which is the fiber bundle that connects the two hemispheres in the brain. This was also led by Jason Wolf. And here, uh, the corpus callosum is divided up into little areas so that we can look at the uh, shape and thickness in these areas. Again, we're looking at six to 24 months. These are pairwise comparisons, high risk autism positive versus low risk, um, high risk positive, high risk negative, et cetera. And the darkness of the red here is the magnitude of the statistical difference um, in size and shape. And so we saw increased corpus callosum area and thickness starting early at six months and then diminishing over time in the infants who developed autism. And then Mark Shen, who was training with David Amaral and then moved to North Carolina to work with Joe Piven, he first published a difference in extraaxial cerebrospinal fluid volume in an independent sample 
of babies developing autism that David Amaral had. Upon moving to work with Joe Piven, he then used different methods to look at CSF volume differences in the IBIS data and found that he could replicate this using different methods and in an independent sample. And so our clinical pediatric neuroradiologists had been telling us just anecdotally that in some of the babies who go on to develop autism, they're seeing excess cerebrospinal fluid. Not that they could make a diagnosis based on that and not that it was at a level that would call, call them to flag for hydrocephalus. So sort of a subclinical incidental finding. But this um, research-based quantification, it, it resonated with what they were seeing. And so here I'm showing a, a low-risk infant uh, who is a ASD negative at 24 months with a normal appearing amount of cerebrospinal fluid. And here's a high-risk infant who developed autism, and you can see excess cerebrospinal fluid here. And I'll just say that this is also something that's been of interest to our group in terms of its potentially predictive power, and we may have more to say about that in the coming year or two. But so by way of interval summary, so early behavior differences, though we find them, early behavior is not sufficient for individual level prediction of autism outcome. And we also have early differences in MRI findings involving white matter fractional and isotropy, corpus callosum shape, extra axial cerebrospinal fluid. These are intriguing group level findings, but they're not predictive at the individual level with the asterisks um, applying to what I just said about cerebrospinal fluid. So I'm gonna move on to talk about individual outcome prediction, and I'm gonna jump right to it and say that in 2017, our network published a paper showing that using structural MRI at six and 12 months, we can predict autism outcome at 24 months at a level that is potentially clinically actionable if replicated. And Heather Hazlett led this. She was the first author on this paper. And so again, we have a very nice uh, sample size here, and I'll walk through the findings. So I talked about larger brains in babies who go on to develop autism. Well, in this study, they looked at how that played out. We could look at cortical thickness, we could look at cortical surface area, volume being the product of thickness and surface area. And the finding was that regionally specific hyperexpansions of cortical surface area between six and 12 months explained the volume overgrowth that was then later measured at 12 to 24 months. And that volume overgrowth then correlated with autism-specific social deficits as measured with the behavior assessments in the IBIS battery. But then importantly, um, Martin Steiner and Heather and others used a machine learning algorithm. It was a, a, the technical term is it's a deep learning network and it was read by a support vector machine, but it's a computer algorithm that can look at high dimensional data find patterns in that, and then classify the data based on those patterns. It does this in a fully cross-validated way where information used to train the machine is not contaminating what you're using to test. And the finding was they had an 81% positive predictive value for autism outcome based on the MRI scans at six and 12 months. And you can see here the high uh, sensitivity and specificity associated with that. And if we look at what's driving some of these results, it's not across the entire brain. So depending how you parcelate the brain, what atlas you use, et cetera, um, here we see that in the statistical model, these are regions that contributed uh, in a significant way to the statistical model that showed increased um, surface area, again, leading to the volume increase and correlating with symptoms. Now, I mentioned I do functional imaging, so, and specifically with this study, functional connectivity magnetic resonance imaging. And in FCMRI, we are looking at the spatial pattern of correlation 
of something called the BOLD signal, the blood oxygen level dependent signal. So in task-based functional imaging, if I'm trying to see what areas are active in your brain when you do something, if I shine a light, neurons in your visual cortex become active, you get increased blood flow to that part of your brain, that brings an excess of oxygenated hemoglobin, that changes magnetic susceptibility, that changes the blood oxygen level dependent signal that the scanner reads. I flash a light, you get a bold signal deflection in your visual cortex. But your brain is constantly active, so even if you're at rest, so if you're resting in the scanner, there's spontaneous activity. In our case, the babies are scanned naturally sleeping. Parents bring them in, they're bottle fed or nursed, they're swaddled, they go to sleep, they have earphones on, and we collect these kinds of data and the structural data while they're sleeping. But with this spontaneous activity, if this part of the brain talks to this part of the brain, here with the spontaneous activity, it will likely be influencing the spontaneous activity here. So it would be in correlation. If there's a fluctuating bold signal that goes with that spontaneous neuronal activity here, then that fluctuating bold signal on the other side, if these regions are correlated, they will go in tight synchrony. So here, this is a paper from Nico Dosenbach et al. And pick your favorite part of the brain, in this case, the right anterior insula. Look at how that signal fluctuates up and down over time, and it's this cyan trace. And then you can go over to the other side of the brain on the left and say, what's the bold signal doing there? And lo and behold, in yellow, it's going up and down in very tight synchrony. And if I were to compute a correlation coefficient between those two waveforms, it'd be very tight because it's very synchronized. And I can paint that on the brain in hot colors for areas that are tightly synchronized. And maybe it goes out of phase, and I can paint that in green. Does that make sense? Folks, okay. So with our data, so here I'm picking a point, what we call placing a seed in right motor cortex. This is in 12-month babies, and I'm showing the functional connectivity pattern, and we see functional connectivity on the left side and in the supplementary motor area. Now if I put down more and more seeds, my brain loses track of all the different kinds of patterns, the different kinds of functional connectivity maps that could be produced. So we turn to represent this either with a matrix or a visual representation, where here uh, 0.29 would be the functional connectivity strength between region 5 and 1. Uh, 0.2 would be between 4 and 1. This has exactly the same information here in this visual representation as above, but that way we could look at the patterns of functional connectivity between a number of different regions. And when we have hundreds, and in our case 230, we can represent it this way, where again, the hot colors are patterns of positive functional connectivity, and the blue colors are negative functional connectivity. So how can we use these to then predict autism outcome? And our question was, could we use the functional connectivity acquired from the infants at six months to predict autism outcome at 24 months? So again, we turn to machine learning. I mentioned deep learning network before. Here we're using an algorithm called support vector machine. And that's an algorithm that the computer performs to do multivariate pattern classification. It works by taking training data with known labels and it finds an algorithm that maps the data to the labels. You give it data that it hasn't seen before and you see what it does with that, and you can measure its accuracy in terms of predicting how things are classified um, based on ground truth. And it does this by projecting the data into a high dimensional space and finding an optimally separating plane between two groups of data. And it can do this, the math of it is such that it can do this with curved surfaces. So here we have each baby has a functional connectivity matrix we can reduce the dimensionality of the data. And again, we do this in a fully cross-validated way, where what we use to train the algorithm is not contaminating um, the data that our training are left out when we do um, classification. 
and we can then measure positive predictive value, other measures of accuracy, and we can evaluate statistical significance by doing randomization. And so what we found was we found that the six-month functional connectivity data accurately predicted autism outcome at 24 months. And this was led by Robert Emerson, who was then a postdoc at Joe, in Joe Piven's lab. And this shows the separation we get of the data in principal component space, so just a way of representing the variance of the data. With the autism positive subjects, points in green. The autism negative subjects, points in red. And interestingly, these two babies that are in the middle of this space were two that were misclassified. <clears throat> it's a relatively small sample. This finding has to be replicated. We're funded now to try to replicate this, but we're very excited about it. With the small sample, there's a confidence interval around this positive predictive value. The lower bound of the confidence interval, 95% confidence interval is around 61, um, but we're, we still find it very encouraging. When we ask what functional connections in the brain are important for this, they're scattered all across the brain. And this shows their correlation with measures of social communication, measures of cognitive ability, measures of repetitive behavior. But I can't look at this and say, oh my gosh, it's obviously connections in the motor network or obviously connections in the default mode network. It's a complex pattern. There are over 900 features that are potentially contributory to classification, and that's what the classification algorithm is sensitive to. So to build on our interval summary, we now know that machine learning approaches can achieve over 80% positive predictive value. We believe this may be clinically actionable, um, and this is using the structural MRI data at six and 12 months, and the functional data at six months. So I'm gonna move for the next part of the talk to talk about our future directions. And this involves the possibility of predicting individual levels of dimensionally measured behaviors that are important for autism and that may be autism intervention targets. So we could think about the possibility in the future of personalizing interventions. So when I give lectures to the medical students and residents and fellows, and I try to introduce the idea of the autism spectrum, which everybody has heard about and has their own ideas, sometimes I appeal to popular media. Anyone know the movie? Some nods, Napoleon Dynamite. Okay, so I saw that movie, and the first time I didn't quite get it, and then I was talking with my colleague John Constantino, I said, you have to re-watch this movie and think about this as a movie about subthreshold autistic traits. Big Bang Theory, people know Big Bang Theory. Sheldon, who probably has autism spectrum disorder symptoms. Many people in the audience are too young here to know this, but some people seen this movie. So the classic movie for uh, what was then DSM-4 autistic disorder, so Rain Man. Any, anyone know who this individual is? Anyone? So, so this is Kim Peek, and he's the individual that the Dustin Hoffman character in this movie was modeled after, and there's a great documentary on him called The Real Rain Man. Interestingly, I don't believe he was ever actually formally diagnosed with autism. He has severe autism symptoms, and he has a genesis of the corpus callosum. But it's a great documentary if you can look it up. But what I'm showing there has been very nicely quantified with measures of autistic traits in the general population. And so I'm showing some of the early work from my colleague John Constantino and our former um, the late Richard Todd, who was our former division chief. And so John developed a measure that many in the room here may use clinically and also in research known as the social responsiveness scale. And that measures the burden of core autistic traits, um, zero being low, it goes almost all the way up to 200 on the high end. And if you give this in a population sample, which is what John did in the state of Missouri, and this is a twin sample, there's a little bit of a difference in the peak for males and females but you see a continuous distribution. So it's not that there's quote unquote typicality or normality in the autism spectrum. 
we are all just on a human spectrum of social relatedness, and that's something very important to remember. And that really contextualizes everything I showed you previously in terms of categorical outcome prediction because things are on a continuum. So we now turn to behaviors that we think exist on a continuum, are very important for autism and autism intervention, and that we also now have the ability to measure dimensionally or continuously. And one of those is joint attention, which was originally described by Scaife and Bruner in a fam famous Nature paper in 1975. And it's well defined here by uh, Emery in a review, and it says joint attention requires that two individuals are attending to the same object based on one individual using attention cues to the second. So I point at the exit sign, and you turn and look at what I'm pointing. I just initiated joint attention, and you responded to joint attention if you turned over there. So this is a pivotal developmental milestone, and it is really a central impairment in autism. It's very strongly associated with later language outcomes, both in typical development and in autism. And autism interventions that push joint attention skills improve language outcome in affected children. And there are multiple randomized controlled trials supporting this. So we ask the question, does the functional connectivity we've collected correlate with measures of joint attention? And this work was led by Adam Egebrecht, who I co-mentored on an NIH training grant. He's now a tenure track assistant professor in radiology at WashU. And so what we did was we took this assessment, the Communication and Symbolic Behavior Scales, the CSBS, which is about a 20-minute semi-structured developmental assessment. And in this assessment, we can say how many times, we can divide it into epochs and say how many times did the baby point to draw the examiner's attention to something? And we're showing this in blue at 12 months, red at 24 months. So some of these babies at 12 months not doing much, a few are doing it. At 24 months, we get more of a shift. And I'm showing this dimensionally. So we're pooling together all the low-risk, high-risk negative, high-risk infants. And so then we said, let's take the functional connectivity. Let's find networks. So this is a mean functional connectivity matrix. I showed that before. We have algorithms that we can perform on this that will pull out brain networks. It's kind of magic, and I could talk about that in the question and answer period. But we can get a default mode network, a dorsal attention network, motor networks, attention and control networks, and we can all do this with the sleeping data that we acquire. So here we have data at 12 months and 24 months, the behavior data I showed you. Each baby contributes a functional connectivity matrix. We've sorted these matrices by network, and then we run brain behavior correlation. So I'm correlating the functional connectivity for each cell in the matrix with behavior across the whole sample. And we have about 100 12-month data sets and about 100 24-month data sets. So this is 27,000 or so brain behavior correlations. And so this is brain behavior correlation here, where hot colors mean the functional connectivity strongly associates with behavior, and cool colors mean it's not as strongly associated. And you see it's not ra random. It's not just snow. And on the left, these blocks, so cyan, that would be the motor network. Red, that would be the default mode network. Blue, that's the visual network. It's forming blocks, and we can quantify this with statistics like chi-square statistics and evaluate significance using randomization. And when we did that, we found two pairs of networks, these two, that showed an enriched level a higher than chance density of brain behavior correlations where the functional connectivity and the behavior associated. And lo and behold, it involved visual network regions and dorsal attention network regions and visual network regions and default mode regions. These are findings at a lower level of significance, but we thought that this had great face validity. I know it's sort of superficial, but we're studying initiation of joint attention, visually based joint attention. We use this abstract brain-based approach, brain-wide approach, and we get visual and dorsal attention network 
we went on to look at other behaviors. So I talked about early motor differences. In older ch children with autism, some 90% of individuals affected with autism have some form of motor problem. So here, out of the IBIS assessment battery, we abstracted items that reflected the development of walking. And this was led by Natasha Maris, who I also co-mentor on an NIHK grant. She's now an assistant professor in psychiatry, MD, PhD, neurobiologist. And when we looked using the same methods that I just described at walking behavior, lo and behold, we have two baby somatomotor networks, and both are implicated, plus connections with the temporal lobe portion of the default mode network. So we thought, okay, we look at walking, we get motor, that's great. What about these temporal lobe default mode network regions? That didn't make so much sense. Steve Peterson and I were talking about this, scratching our heads. Natasha ran this through a meta-analytic database called Neurosynth that looks at over 10,000 published results in older subjects. And almost all of these regions in the temporal lobe that connected with these motor regions had attributed motor functions in adults. And some of them were visualization of biological motion, inner limb coordination, et cetera. So we thought that gave further face validity. This work here is taking a similar approach to restricted and repetitive behavior in autism. This was led by Claire McKinnon, who is an undergraduate, who did this as honors thesis work in my lab. She's now a graduate student in neurobiology at U Chicago. And here what we did was we broke repetitive behavior broadly into five categories, four of which have relevance for infants at the age we studied. We looked at restricted behavior, stereotype behavior, ritualistic sameness behavior, and self-injurious behavior. We had no significant findings for self-injury, but we did have significant findings for the other three domains. And we had a complex pattern that I think Claire neatly summarized with this figure. And I'll walk through it. And so here I'm just showing the networks involved and the relationship between connectivity and behavior. So as functional connectivity between the visual network and part of the frontal parietal control network, a network involved in the higher level executive control of behavior. As those go down, we have increased ritualistic and sameness behavior at 12 and 24 months. When we have decrease in connectivity between visual and these default mode regions, we have increased stereotype behavior at 12 months and increased ritualistic sameness behavior. When we have increased connectivity between subcortical and dorsal attention regions, we have increased stereotype behavior at 24 months. And here, if there are cognitive neuroscientists in the room, they may know that the default mode network in adults is often thought to be a network that goes anti-correlated or out of phase with attention and control networks. And here our finding is that when this relationship is abnormal, when it is more positive than it should be. Here we have increased stereotype behavior and restricted behavior at 24 months and increased restricted behavior. So this seemed to tell at least a reasonable story. And now what I'm showing is a real work in progress future direction where we're trying to see if we can model relationships between connectivity and behavior across time for behaviors that are linked in time in ways that are important. So I mentioned early joint attention leading to later language, joint attention improving intervention, improving autism outcome. We said, could we look using the methods I just described at functional connections that contributed to joint attention behavior at an early time point and language at a later time point? And this is being led by Alex Todorov, who's a statistician in our group, and we embedded multivariate longitudinal modeling. So we're running a multivariate longitudinal model for each of the 27,000 connections, a lot of computations, but we're getting some initial results. And lo and behold, these are intra-network connections within the dorsal attention network. And so again, this is a future direction. But again, to summarize, We've found specific functional connectivity correlates for specific behaviors, joint attention, walking, subtypes of repetitive behavior. 
Different networks are involved at different ages. The findings have some level of face validity. We have this early idea that we could maybe find FCMRI correlates of multiple behaviors linked across development. And this points to the possibility of a future where we might be able to predict individual profiles. This baby could have these strengths, these weaknesses, and need these specific supports. So we are now funded to attempt to replicate and generalize the categorical outcome prediction findings that I showed at the beginning of the talk. And importantly, we need to understand the ethical implications of doing this. And we need to see if we can generalize what we've done to predict continuous findings. And so this new project, we call it our IBIS Early Prediction Project. I'm co-leading this with Joe Piven. We will have the opportunity to do what I just said in 250 new high-risk infants on a new scanner platform. We're also going to do more rigorous tests of the predictive power of behavior. And we're going to do predictive testing involving some of the behaviors that we show basic correlations for and in areas where we think that these may be relevant to future autism intervention, language, social responsiveness, joint attention, and repetitive behavior. And this work is synergizing with other funded efforts at the moment. So Kelly Botteron, who is our site PI, um, she's also got a new co cohort of low-risk infants, and that's important to contextualize the findings we see in high risk. Jason Wolf here has uh, funding to study low-risk infants using the same measures that we're using in our ibis -EP study. Dr. Botteron also, in parallel with us, got funding for a multi-site Down syndrome grant. So we will have the opportunity to do cross-disorder comparisons, comparing babies with Down syndrome to babies who develop autism. And just very recently, Shafali Jeste, who's an investigator at UCLA, received R01 funding to add EEG onto our project. So in addition to brain imaging, we will be collecting EEG. This is in conjunction with collecting measures of eye tracking. Um, and Jed Ellison is leading that effort on this project. And I mentioned ethics. We are partnering with a number of bioethicists and Kate McDuffie is a postdoc in our network who now has uh, BRAINS F32 funding to do parent interviews to study parent preferences with the idea of our getting a better handle on the ethical and social implication issues associated with early uh, prediction. And so if we're successful, what we envision is the possibility of enrolling infants who would show positivity on a first year of life predictive MRI measure. We would then be able to triage them to controlled trials of emerging infant interventions. These interventions have not been created yet. So while we're working on all this, Autism behavior intervention researchers are trying to take what's working with three-year-olds and say, how would I do this with a baby in the first year of life? We think that su successful dimensional outcome prediction might enable future personalized treatments. And we also think that um, brain measures could potentially index responses to treatment and trials. We need to think carefully about extension. Everything I've talked about is in this high risk where we know 20% are gonna develop autism spectrum disorder. But we need to be thinking about how we could generalize and move this to the general population where prevalence is one in 59. That's one of the most powerful reasons for including measures like EEG and eye tracking. And we're very excited they've been added on because they're lower cost and potentially more disseminable than MRI for general population. We might also envision some form of behavior measure that's maybe imperfect, maybe not on its own clinically actionable, but then in a low risk setting says, wow, this baby's at a little bit higher risk, kind of like what we know from high familial risk status, and then those babies might get imaged. And so those are the ways we're thinking about extending what we're doing in high risk to the general population.
And the whole idea is that we think that there may be greater benefits for earlier treatment. And we think that that's true because the autism behaviors aren't consolidated yet. The brain is more plastic at this age. And the social deficits characteristic of autism and the repetitive behaviors wouldn't be complicating attempts to treat. And that's our current vision. So I thank you very much for your attention, and I'd be happy to take questions. Autistic uh, adolescents and adults have greater cortical surface area and greater infolding of the sulci. That's that was that, applied by. Yeah, that that's not known, and and there's a little bit of mix in findings about whether. So we think that that brain volume finding that led into this is explained at this age by what I showed with the surface area hyperexpansion. In some investigators' hands, the reports are that those brain volume findings kind of regress to the mean as people age, whereas others are showing that they persist. The question of the persistence of relatively expanded surface area into later childhood, um, we don't know the answer to that. I mentioned the third wave of our study where the infants who were um, contributing the data that I talked about they're now returning at age 10, and that's a work in progress. So we're collecting those data um, and, and looking at school age outcome measures and doing multimodal brain imaging. And the question you asked is something that's going to be analyzed in that data. Yep. I have an unrelated question. The use of the, these high risk uh, families and controls, do, do you? See, there any uh, confounders there in generalizing to families without an autistic older sibling? Does that influence the parental behavior towards the baby? Or at an older age, the older sibling that's autistic mo is modeling some behavior that the younger sibling could pick up on? Do you, do you, you see that as being? Uh, a factor when, when you, if you try to generalize these findings and behavior to uh, norm, regular families without an autistic uh, kid? But that's another excellent question. And so it, there's, there's a lot in that question, too. And so part of the ongoing efforts associated with what I talked about with the school age follow up study is to explore associated parent factors, to look at so we have this older diagnosed child and then the infant that we're following longitudinally, but are there, are there findings in the brain imaging data in those infants that are related to behavior features in the older sibling or aspects of the parents? And then there's this whole issue of what we call simplex versus multiplex autism, simplex being where there's only one affected individual in the family. And by the nature of this design, we've got a design where we're studying families where there's more than one affected individual. And aside from whatever the parents might be doing different or the social environment of the home, there's that whole familial or genetic, you know, contribution that could be playing out differently in simplex versus multiplex. And those are studies that are underway. Some of those are questions that are being asked by investigators in our network um, now. One very, if I could just take one more minute on that. Um, one, one thing that's very interesting that we can, uh, that, that, that our, our group has in part led by folks at the Philadelphia site, and one of Joe Piven's postdocs who now moved to UT Dallas is looking at the parent language environment. And so they've sent like little microphones in bibs and the baby wears this bib for 24 hours 
and it records baby vocalizations, but also parent speech. And analyses can then be done on the qualities of the baby vocalizations, but also how many words are the parents speaking to the babies? And are there conversational turns? Does baby babble when mom uses mother ease to talk to baby, et cetera? And so those are some other kinds of things that we're looking at, um, loosely related to the question you asked. So, thank you. Hi, thanks so much for that talk. Um, it was really interesting. I have a question um, about um, thinking about sort of the stability of the measurements that you're using for individual level prediction, um, specifically with the functional data. So that can influence both how the model is trained um, and also during the test phase if some data from a sleeping kid maybe aren't super representative of um, what their data might look like even on the same day. Um, there's some evidence that uh, functional data is less stable, and I'm wondering if in your, any of your longitudinal work you're looking at this or if this is something your team has looked at. That, that's another excellent question and a very tough question. <laughs> and, and I'll just start by saying that there's so many compromises that get put into you know, trying, trying to do this work and trying to do multimodal imaging. Um, I'll, I'll state my, my opinion, which might not be popular in my own network, but that, that if, if it were just the question of using functional connectivity, that's all I would acquire. Because the work from my close collaborator, Steve Peterson's group, has shown that with the functional connectivity at the individual level, you're getting representations, for instance, of the group level network structure only when you're getting out to about 40 minutes of acquired data. So the data that I showed you here, we're collecting, we're trying to get 16 and a half minutes, and we're using the state of the art motion artifact mitigation procedures and cleaning in QC. And so we're trying to get down to about six minutes of super ultra clean data, um, which, which isn't a lot. And so, you know, that data would be insufficient for doing individual level specification of network structure. How that specifically relates to individual prediction of a later behavior is a whole nother question that would probably be a a neat project for a postdoc or a, an engineer to, to work on. So, you know, you, you, you're, you're asking fantastic questions. With the new study, we'll be able to collect approximately 21 minutes of functional data. Um, you know, the results seem to be robust, but I don't, I, I mean, and, and, and the thing that points toward robustness in, in the results, I think, and Joe Piven and others in our network think, is that we have these potentially clinically actionable positive predictive values using multiple independent MRI modalities. And we're seeing right now if prediction based on regional cerebrospinal fluid volumes does what we're seeing here with the structural and the functional. But the structural and functional convergence is, is kind of a neat thing, but I'm, I'm I, try to be as objective as I can be in my mental approach to this, and we have to see that what we showed replicates in an independent sample, because the other thing, in addition to what you said, we use these cross-validation approaches for developing our machine learning classifiers, okay? And they're always touted as, okay, the safe way to do things, and we've done it in this fully cross-validated manner, I, I'm, I'm not aware of a single instance where a highly accurate machine learning outcome result that was generated using these cross-validation approaches, and then that classifier was crystallized and applied to data that were completely independent that someone else collected and it worked as well. I'm not aware that that's ever happened in any field, okay? In the design of this study, 
we specifically included that in the grant, and that was part of our justification for the sample size and the power analysis we did. So our plan in the project that we're currently funded to do is to replicate what we did previously, but to take half the data. So if we're going to get 250, we're going to take about the first 125, and we're going to develop predictive classifiers using leave-out cross-validation approaches there. And we're going to set aside half that data that, that's never been even used for that cross-validation approach. We're going to crystallize the classifiers, and then we're going to then see if it works in the data that's, that's set aside. And those are the measures we're going to take to get at that question of the robustness of prediction. So I don't know if that addressed it. Thank you for a really impressive talk here. Um, Sorry. <laughs> Uh, I'm particularly curious about your last point regarding the ethics, and as you were speaking, I was yeah. thinking about one of my patients who's a 18-year-old young woman, and really the bulk of our work at this point is around where should she be accommodating to sort of the typical neurotypical community, and where is it reasonable for her to hope that the neurotypical community would be accepting of her. Yeah. And so uh, I heard you reference parents, and I'm curious if there's been any thought to sort of look at the ethical questions with adolescents who might be able to sort of think through these puzzles? That's an excellent question. And so, so we had a grand vision about this, and we've, we've been on a quest to get funding for it. Um, our postdoc, Kate, has, has beat us. <laughs> and, 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 but but we've, we've been trying to go in to, to get R01 level, R01 level funding to, to address these issues and to get parent perspectives, provider perspectives um, to, to ask individuals who uh, live with autism to get perspectives from the neurodiversity community, et cetera. And, you, you know, we think particularly pertinent to this question of pre-symptomatic identification. So, you know, we, we kind of think it would be good. Yeah, I actually had a slide about this in case someone asked. but. You know, we don't, we don't really know, and we can just learn from other fields. So um, we've, we've partnered with bioethicists like Don Bailey, who have done work in Fragile X, um, and Ben Wilfond, who's at Seattle Children's Research Institute, who works with cystic fibrosis patients, um, and Holly P.A. at Research Triangle. And some of the issues we're thinking about are, you know, differential vulnerabilities, um, impact on family dynamics. So... Uh, we, we, we think looking to other disorders that people aren't, you, you know, that, that there's a move now to, 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 to say more, even in conditions where we're giving you a diagnosis that we may not even have a treatment for today. Okay, so that's the other part of it is that we would be saying your six-month baby that looks like any typical six-month baby now is going to be affected by something eight months from now. And also, in 2019, we don't have a treatment for this. We're, we're hoping that we'll get there. But what we envision is that even if we have success with what we're doing, there's not going to be an evidence-based treatment. It's going to be talking about enrolling in a randomized controlled trial of something that we hope might work. So the parents are also going to have to be amenable to taking this information and accepting that their child might be randomized to A versus B or A versus a control treatment or maybe control or wait list and then, you know, you do it, do it stepwise, um, et cetera. But all the points you brought up about heterogeneity and societal differences, et, et cetera, because when I put on my clinical hat and so I see toddlers for autism evaluations in my clinic, and when we make a diagnosis, there's nothing to go on scientifically to say, based on what I'm seeing now, I know how your child is going to be when they're 15 or 20. And the consensus amongst the experts is that by about age five, overall level of cognitive functioning, overall language ability, amount of functional language may be very predictive or, you know, more, more predictive than other things. But... You know, in terms of saying, is your child going to be high-functioning, low-functioning? Is your child going to be a doctor, an autism researcher, an engineer? Or is your child going to be, 
uh, nonverbal, institutionalized, um, et cetera. And, and then there are uh, other factors just pertinent to the specifics of what we're doing with the early prediction work related to, you know, I talked about positive predictive value. And we've stressed the importance of a 24-month diagnosis. And there are others that argue against us that, well, you've got a, a nothing solid till 36. And clinically, you know, if I see a child with strong autism behaviors is 24 months, we're not going to wait 12 months to intervene. You know, so we would want to be basing our, that's why we chose to base our predictive outcome work in terms of training classifiers in reference to a 24-month diagnosis. But there's a little bit of play, 15%, 20%, crossing diagnostic lines between 24 and 36 months, and a little bit of play after that. So there's a if you ask how much do I believe in the negative predictive value, there's a residual uncertainty associated with those negative predictive values. And there's some ethical issues associated with that. So these are all things we're thinking about. Um, Kate is off to a start doing parent interviews to, to get parent preferences. She has one paper published already. Um, and we're trying to regroup. We've taken two shots at R01 level funding, and we're likely to take a third shot to study the ethics of this. So, yeah. so presumably you don't know what phase the infants are in in their sleep pattern. There's no way to control for it. Can you comment on whether you yeah. believe um, these metrics are stable across the sleep cycle and whether the differences that you see are stable across the sleep cycle and um, a related question, have you looked into functional dynamic connectivity in, in these data? Can I just dodge the first question completely? <laughs> no. Um, so, so I'll take the, the second one, is functional dynamic connectivity, and that plays back to um, my answer to an earlier question about the amount of time that it requires, and what we really think is for looking at this, we need kind of an integrated measure of the functional connectivity over as long a period of time as we can get. So this is something that you know, we might talk about outside the room or have a longer debate about, but my close collaborators and I are a little cautious about the dynamic functional connectivity approaches for those reasons, just because of the value we place in getting long runs of functional connectivity and kind of integrating measures over that. In terms of the sleep state, no, we don't know. I mean, just, you know, we've, we've, we've you know, they may be in different sleep states. Um, you, you know, we, we do have a little bit of, um, from six to 24 months, there is, th th there are greater differences in proportion of REM sleep, for instance, if we were looking at two or three months versus 24 months. So. Um, but no, we, we, we don't know. That's extremely hard work to do. Um, the uh, uh, Laus and Teglia Zucci, um, th their group in Germany doing work on sleep functional connectivity in adults, that's sort of the state of the field, and it's taken them a decade or more to acquire enough data from enough subjects that's sleep staged, so we could say that this functional connectivity pattern is reflective of stage two or three or four sleep. It's just incredibly difficult to do. To do that right would require simultaneous fMRI, EEG. We've talked about it, and then we've gone, I don't want to do that. <laughs> so, yes. So uh, to go back to your question or to the uh, discussion of the different classifiers for machine learning, I understand a little bit that uh, in genetics there are published classifiers that can be used for machine learning that can be kind of then applied to independent samples by independent groups. Do you think that that's the field that the direction that this field is going in terms of publishing the classifiers, making them? available for other people to use? Is that something we should expect to see people doing? Is that something you've thought about? 
Yeah. So no, we, 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 we have thought about that. And so the classifiers that we have, and this, this, this is another interesting and, and it gets into ethical <laughs> discussions too. Um, and, and, and so the whole idea here is that if we're moving toward the possibility of a clinical test, there has to be a product that industry could take. But as scientists, we have to dissociate ourselves from that. I, I mean, it, you know, everybody chooses to do these things differently, but we personally have decided to go at that route. So Joe and I and the others involved in this, so, so we have intellectual property associated with this, but we've given it away. We've, we've, we're not, we've just signed away all our personal rights and royalties, et cetera. But we had to do that to protect it so that someone could take it and commercialize it. Because us then showing that we can do this scientifically is one thing, but then showing that it's gonna work on this MRI scanner with this head coil and this and that is something that industry would have to, would, would, would have to do. Um, and, and so that's, that, that's, yep. Yes. Yeah, fabulous talk. And there's so much, there was so much in your talk that just uh, kind of, you know, got me, got me thinking. Uh, I mean, and even just going back to the beginning of your talk, um, certainly, what was uh, what was appearing in your data is sort of an intermediate phenotype um, in the in the um, kids who were um, who did not go on to get autism, yeah. um, and that may be, I'm assuming, uh, perhaps unique to the fact that these are multiplex families. I don't know, but that starts to raise as you were looking at some of the behaviors yeah. and even some of the trajectories over the over the brain-based measures. Um, so I was just wondering your comments on that. Sure. Yeah. Um, and then the uh, the second thing that was um, Kind of, I think in, in some, became implicit towards the end of your talk, but again, I found myself wondering towards the first half is, you know, as you're presenting sort of these, these um, re I mean, really kind of fascinating trajectories, I found myself thinking, what is it that, what are the different um, uh, genetic, molecular, cellular mechanisms that are leading to this sort of stage of brain overgrowth in yeah. a sense, and then sort of uh, a regression and given that we know that they are these sort of multiple genetic contributors, you know, what is the current thinking in the field that you've got sort of convergence right. on several pathways of, of molecular and cellular and network development uh, impairments that are leading to these sort of this very abnormal pattern of growth? So I just, your comments yeah. on that as well. And then within that, towards the end, is your, the implication that even within this overall trajectory we see, there may be very, uh, a lot of inter-individual variation yeah. in the specific nature of these altered trajectories with respect to specific brain circuits? Yeah. I mean, there was a lot, there's a lot to unpack there. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll start with the latter parts of it and, and the genetics. I mean, I'll just say briefly, I mean, we, we, we think that they're, they're, they're polygenetic. Um, we're, we're actually screening out uh, clearly identified genetic syndromes that are associated with autism in terms of on the front end for enrolling to the study. So, you know, if someone had tuberous sclerosis, et cetera, they would be screened out of the study. But so we think, you know, there, there are probably multiple associated genes. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of what would be specifically the pathway between that and overgrowth, I would defer that question to Joe Piven or John Constantino or someone in our group who's expert in that way. But what you were talking about with the high-risk negatives is something I completely glossed over, just talked about them as kind of one lump group. Well, so I, I showed that in the general population, autism symptoms are continuously distributed. Then when we look in this high-risk group, you know, and we do these um, dichotomous outcome decisions, so autism positive, high-risk negative, et cetera. In the high-risk negative group, that's a real mixed bag. So you could be high-risk negative because you know, your ADOS score is just one tick below what would have given you a clinical best estimate. So we think that about 20% of those high-risk negatives are subthreshold autism. They just have attenuated symptoms of autism. And maybe another 20% have non-autistic language, motor, and or cognitive delays. And then another 
set of those high-risk negatives are really typical. They look for all the world like the typical. And so that's another ongoing effort is to come up with ways of, of, of studying those subgroups, studying them behaviorally, imaging, and how does the brain and behavior um, in, inform that. And, and that's the other reason for doing dimensional outcome prediction in addition to categorical, because if I'm seeing a child in my clinic who's got very impairing symptoms and they're just one tick short of a DSM diagnosis, they still need ABA and speech therapy, et cetera. And so we really want to make sure we're identifying those. And the continuous outcome prediction work is sort of a, a it, 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 then, it then will, in addition to this idea, which may even be kind of science fiction-ish about um, individual profiles, maybe that'll be reality. But what it really does is it's letting us capture the subthreshold kids because they're going to be 40% in this high-risk ne high negative group that are going to need intervention, even though they don't get an autism outcome. So it's great. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm a clinician that works in the community and am a consultant to the Federal Aviation Administration. And I'm asked to do evaluations on young men and women who want to become pilots. And uh, recently, I've had a series of people who come in with a history of a diagnosis of uh, Asperger's or AD uh, pervasive development disorder or autism spectrum disorder. My question is, if we were to test these people with uh, information that you've derived with infants and, children, and young children, would we find same similar uh, patterns of functional disorder to confirm or to deny a diagnosis of uh, PDD, or autism spectrum disorder. Um, <clears throat> because, as it turns out, the FAA um, uh, finds that autism and uh, spectrum disorders are disqualifying for people to become pilots. So it's a very critical question of, is it there? And if it's wow. then how much? That, well, that, that, that's an excellent question, and I, didn't, I did not know that about the policy. Um, I, that, I mean, I'll just immediately give a knee-jerk reaction with my opinion about that policy. I think that's, that's, that's wrong. And, and you, there are people with autism spectrum disorder in, in every walk of life and every profession. I mean, uh, academic faculty, uh, lawyers, doctors, uh, et cetera. And I, I bet that many of the best pilots, there, there are some of the best pilots in the world might be on the autism spectrum. So, um, but, in, but in terms of um, what, what we're doing with infant outcome prediction, so we're looking at early MRI and predicting later behavior, you could um, re-engineer the problem to say that I'm looking at a brain in imaging signature for the diagnosis right now, um, I would just say you diagnose behaviorally. I mean, to us, the reason for using MRI is because we have no behavior symptoms in infancy that are predictive in a clinically actionable way. And so that's, that's the importance of using MRI. I mean, there might be other reasons for doing it, um, but the kind of thought experiment then, if we were, if everything we did and said is correct and replicable and robust, if we were to have imaged someone who, as an adult, has a diagnosis, if we had imaged them when we were, they were a baby, the hope would be that the finding would be there. I see. Yeah. Thank you. Right. If that makes sense. Yes, it does. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome.